Good morning, Calvary Church. Can y'all do me a favor? Just stand to your feet, feet and give Jesus a good hand clap this morning. Come on. Now, now, now tell your neighbor on both sides, say, I can't help that Jesus made me this good looking. Go ahead and tell him that. Come on. Come on. And then tell him, say, you're not so bad yourself. Hallelujah. Are y'all ready for part three of, of our installment of group therapy two? If you're ready, somebody say Amen. We are in this series that I love because it's really backed by popular demand. We tackled earlier in the year, y'all, we tackled some, some of the tough topics that we don't often talk about in church. Items and subjects that are somewhat taboo in religious circles that we feel like are more, uh, you know, they're more reserved for the couch time with our therapist or in self-help books that we read when the truth of the matter is Jesus is always the solution to any problem we face and the gospel helps bring clarity because we believe here at Calvary Church that God really does want you to prosper in all things including your soul say hello somebody talking about your mind will and emotions not just prosperity in your finances but in every area of your life we desire to live the abundant life Jesus paid for and in order to do that we've got to confront some issues. We've got to heal from some soul wounds that many of us are struggling with or, or we're or facing the residue of or we are even have unprocessed pain that was caused by trauma in certain areas of our lives when we went through certain events that have caused us just really some, some challenging issues. And so we are tackling that. We pressed pause last week because we had Ashley and Carly tear this. How many of y'all enjoyed that word last week from Ashley on how to hear from God? What a, a timely message we had last week. And certainly thank Ashley for uh, tear this for that great word. But, uh, but I want to dive right back into our series today and deal with a strong Issue and this is a thing. Today is a challenge. It's an issue that that every one of us either has faced, is facing, or will face. I want to talk today about the challenge of disappointment. Everybody say disappointment. Well, you have been disappointed. In fact, if you know what it's like to be disappointed, just wave at your pastor. Come on, somebody. So I want to talk about this today. And before we dive in, let me just reiterate what you heard Chad say tonight, y'all. I believe last time we had our, our first night of ministry, it was incredible how people got healed, both emo from emotional baggage, but also physical healing that manifested. So come hang out with us tonight at six. We'll see what God wants to do. It really is the space we've created for the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. And so come hang out with us tonight and let's see what Jesus has in store for us. I want to invite you. Another thing real quick. I want to encourage you to get involved in our gospel circles because we are hearing incredible testimonies about how God is moving in our intimate environments and in our, our, our gathering communities of believers and we're just gathering around the good news and we've got them in cities all over and you know I love that. We've got them here in Wallace. We've got them in Clinton and Burgall and Wilmington. I actually attended the Wilmington one this past week. Now we've got them in New Bern and in and Wilson. So make sure you get uh, signed up for our gospel circles or just show up because it really is where we get to gather around the good news of Jesus and feed our souls. Amen. The last thing I want to share with you is this. It, it is an exciting day to be a part of Calvary because in Texas today, we are actually launching and revealing our brand new campus, Calvary Brownwood. Somebody say, come on, Jesus. Man, what a great day. Pastor Ben is in Brownwood with Pastors Bob and Elia Smithson. So we celebrate with them today uh, as they are launching that new campus. And we've already got some more in the pipeline. And I'm gonna let you in a little secret. We've got one that's gonna take place starting next year in North Carolina. Come on, somebody. Our next, our next North Carolina location. So, so excited about all that God's doing in Calvary. Are y'all ready to talk about disappointment? All right, I need permission today, y'all. I'm gonna ask. You know I'm gonna preach it anyway, but I need permission today to really... To, 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 to press on some hurt places. Is that all right? I'm talking about really dealing with some trauma and uncovering some wounds that need to be healed. Some wounds we need to expose so we can heal from them. Let me say it like this. There's some things, some pain you need to confront in order to conquer. Because slapping a Band-Aid on it and pretending it's not there does not heal us, Amen. So we've got to be able to address it, look at it, and say, what does the gospel say? And I want to use today 
I'm going to call today's message a family affair because I want to use a family that is found in the Gospels who were friends of Jesus where we see Jesus help bring healing to areas of lives that were caused by disappointment. And this is what I know to be a fact. Disappointment really is the gap that exists between expectation and experience. You got to hear me today, y'all. In other words, it's when what we think is going to happen doesn't look like what actually happened. Are y'all getting this? Can I just ask for your help today to preach this thing? Like it needs to be preached. Nine o'clock had to help me. I want you to help me today. It's when what happens doesn't look like what you expected to happen. So you got to be able to press into and lean into truth and understanding. If not, you will misdiagnose your disappointment as God not showing up when the truth is he just shows up like, like you didn't expect him to. And so I want to deal with this issue today and really begin to uncover some pain we may have from disappointment because here's what I know. Pain that is not addressed, that is not processed, that stems from disappointment can cause us to begin to lower our expectations and watch this, even lose hope as a way to protect our hearts from keeping that pain to be repeated. In fact, let me just say it like this. Disappointment brings pain. And when it's not processed, we have a tendency to protect ourselves in order to keep that disappointment from ever being experienced again. So now we'll begin to expect things in fear instead of faith. We'll begin to frame our future with expectations of hurt rather than expectations of hope in order to prevent us from ever experiencing that feeling of being let down again. And here's how it's expressed. Let me just make it real and practical, ready? So we'll begin to pray with people that need a healing and we'll pray for healing, but even though deep down, we really don't believe that miracle's gonna manifest because of what happened another time. Or we'll begin to settle in places that God never called us to settle in so that we don't make ourselves vulnerable to being rejected for that promotion or that next opportunity. In other words, I don't want to get my hopes up because of what happened in the past, so I'll just settle right here at a place where God never called me to settle. Or maybe we'll begin to build walls in between us and others because we've bought into a lie that says, well, they're going to end up betraying me just like the last person ended up betraying me. And we'll begin to develop expectations of the worst in people instead of the best in people. Are y'all picking up what I'm laying down today? Come on. When the pain of disappointment is not properly processed, watch this. The mechanisms we put in place to protect ourselves can end up being toxic to our faith. In other words, you'll start to build in defense mechanisms that you think are good, but really it's toxic to your faith because you'll begin to operate in a place of hopelessness. And we'll stop dreaming with God because we're afraid of having nightmares. Hey, y'all don't want to talk to me today, but I'm going to preach. In other words, we don't, want to, we don't want to get our hopes up too high, so I'm just going to be okay with whatever this looks like. I'm not going to... Trust God too big because if I trust God too big, he might let me down. Well, I came to tell somebody, God is never going to let you down. He may not do it like you want him to do it, but God has always got you right where he wants you. But when you have unprocessed pain from disappointment, you'll begin to live your life according to that pain you've been through. I want to specifically deal today with three types of disappointment. Let me just say, there are many sources of disappointment. I'm going to deal with three of them today, but I don't care what the source of your disappointment is. Watch this. The solution is always Jesus. And so as we talk about these different sources of disappointment today, just recognize the power of grace moves us to a place where we not only heal from it, we'll begin to grow in it. Are y'all talking? Y'all me? Listen, so, so in other words, not only am I going to heal from my past, it's going to set me up to be able to process my future so that when I see it, I see things from the right perspective. The first thing we need to recognize about grace when it comes to disappointment is this. Grace helps you deal, everybody say deal. Deal with your disappointment, watch this, in others. It helps you deal with your disappointment in others. 
By a show of hands, is there anybody in here who's ever been disappointed by somebody else? If you hadn't, go ahead and wave at me and I'll call you up so you can testify. Because <laughs> everybody has been let down by somebody. And it's challenging sometimes whenever we have expectations in others that they don't live up to. In the 10th chapter of Luke, there's a story where Jesus and the disciples have gathered together at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Listen to what it says in verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village uh, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Martha had a sister named Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. So she approached Jesus and said to him, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve you alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Don't you love it when people try to get God to talk to somebody on their behalf? How many times have you said, Lord, I wish you would really fix that coworker I got. Y'all better talk to me. Lord, you better deal with these children because if I deal with them, it's not going to be very gracious. Come on, somebody. We love to ask Jesus to speak somebody on our behalf. And she says, will you please address her and tell her to help me? Watch this. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good part which will not be taken away from her. I love this. I love this right here, y'all, because Martha is disappointed in her sister Mary. Martha has disappointment in somebody else. In other words, she's expecting her sister Mary to help her, and when Mary didn't live up to that expectation, now Martha is disappointed because Sometimes our expectations don't line up with our reality. Now, 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 now let's press pause for the calls and just talk for a moment, y'all, because the reality is that this particular situation in the grand scheme of things really is not that big a deal. See, see when I talk about disappointment, our minds immediately go to big things. They go to these life-altering events that occur where we have our entire world shaken because our expectation wasn't met. But can I just tell you right now, most of your disappointments are found in everyday life. And most of your disappointments are not life-changing events. Most of them are just enough to raise your blood pressure a few digits. Let me help you out. Have you ever pulled away from the drive through at Starbucks, got about three miles down the road, and you take a sip of your coffee and you find out what I ordered is not what I got? Y'all holler at your boy if you know what I'm talking about. Right? And you get disappointed. Why? Because first of all, I can't believe Starbucks. I thought it had glory in Starbucks. Starbucks didn't meet my expectation. But second of all, I, I had an expectation that it was going to taste one way and it only tastes like something else. And we get what? Disappointed. Some of y'all are so Connected to your coffee addiction, you have to pull over and speak in tongues. But, but, but the truth of the matter is like, at the end of the day, you know what? You, know, you, you got the wrong coffee. I mean, it is what it is. Or maybe it's when you have an expectation of your 11-year-old to clean their room before dinner only to find out when you go to tuck them into bed, not only have they failed to meet the expectation of cleaning their room, their room looks worse now than it did before dinner. And you get what? Disappointed. Or maybe it's in at work when you had an expectation that a project was going to turn out one way only to have it turn out another way and it hadn't you know, severely derailed your career. But at the end of the day, watch this. It's caused you a place of, huh, I'm let down because this is what my expectation was. I love that Jesus uses this example to address disappointment in others because while it's not a life-changing thing, it is something we experience in everyday life. I mean, at the end of the day, Martha's mad because her sister didn't help her with the dishes. That, that, that's not like a, a, huge, a huge, super big deal. But in this moment, it's caused Martha some disappointment. Martha's upset because Mary isn't living up to her 
expectation. But I want to do something. I don't want to address Mary's performance. I want to address Martha's projection in this. Can I just let you know a little secret? Some of us are disappointed in others. Watch this. Because they aren't living up to an expectation that they don't even know exists. Can I just tell you what I really think? I don't really think Mary woke up that morning and said, how can I make my sister mad today? I really don't think Mary was thinking, you know, what can I do to push the buttons on Martha's dial to get her all up in sorts today? In fact, I really don't think Mary was thinking about Martha at all. I think Mary was so concerned with the fact that Jesus was in her house, y'all don't miss this, that Martha had never crossed her mind. And I just wanna let some of you know, while you think some people are deliberately trying not to meet your expectations, the reality is you haven't even shown up on their radar. I know you think you know, the world revolves around you, but the only world that revolves around you is your world. And some of us are disappointed because we feel like others are deliberately letting us down. And the truth of the matter is, they aren't even concerning themselves with you. Because like you, they're worried about their own lives and their own selves. And Mary is simply living life focused on what's going on while Martha is so focused on what Mary's doing, she's missed the greater portion. Mary's simply focused on Jesus. She haven't, hasn't even considered what Martha is expecting. Why? Because I don't believe Martha has really expressed what her expectations are. I'm going to help some of you out right here. This might be marriage advice, but it is relationship advice regardless. Watch this. Some of you are living in unexpressed expectations of others and you're expecting others to read your mind. When you haven't expressed your expectations, what you're telling everybody else is, is you need to know what I'm thinking and what I expect. So if you're going to hold people accountable to an expectation, you've got to at least make sure you articulate what that expectation is. I am helping somebody's marriage right now because some of you are mad at your spouse because they're not doing what you want them to do and you have never taken the time to sit down and say, let me share with you what my expectations are. And if you will simply express your expectations, it'll help you because it'll begin to alleviate disappointment. Just remember this, y'all. Clarity is kindness. When you are being unclear about your expectations, you're actually being unkind to somebody else because it's not fair. You're upset because they aren't doing it and they don't even know why or what it is you want them to do. Here's another key, watch this. Revelation, y'all, ready? You can't control what others do. Watch this, Martha's mad because she can't get Mary to do what Martha wants her to do. Once you express I'm going to go ahead and tell you now. I'm going to go ahead and prophesy to you. You ready? Watch this. If you are always thinking you can dictate and determine what everybody else does, you are going to live in perpetual disappointment because you can't control anybody. Watch this. In fact, close your eyes for a minute. I want to prophesy over you. You ready? Here it is. Watch this. You are not the Holy Spirit. You can't make anybody do what you think they should do. In fact, even the Holy Spirit doesn't force people to do what he wants them to do. So the first thing we gotta do is we gotta recognize that the beauty of God's grace is it creates space for others to grow in grace 
and mature into who God's called them to be at their pace. Christians don't understand this. That's why we get frustrated when Joe gets saved one Sunday and next Sunday he isn't walking like a 12-year saint. I can't believe they would get saved and then still drink beer. Why not? They've been drinking beer for 30 years. Like you gotta give them space to walk out the revelation of who God's made them. Well, I can't believe they still, they still go to those places. I can't believe they still hang out with those type of people. I can't believe they still say those types of words. Like, my God, how, how about this? How about we begin to trust God to do what only God can do and let the Holy Spirit begin to work on folk from the inside out instead of us trying to control what they do to make them be something they aren't even sure they are yet. Are y'all getting this? Like, you gotta stop being frustrated because you can't control everybody else. Parents, let me help you out. Watch this. You cannot control your kids. You can't. And you're mad. I, I remember I thought when those two were little, they were two of the best behaved kids I'd ever seen. And I used to poke my chest out and go, we must be good parents. Because they always did what they were supposed to. And then when that one was born. <laughs> who is just like his daddy. I begin to realize, you know what? It ain't got nothing to do with our parenting skills. <laughs> Bless their hearts. They were raised up under the law. He was raised up under grace. <laughs> He'd have never made it in their world. <laughs> But I had to come to realization that I can't control anybody. So what do we do? We need to, here's an idea, watch this. If you're frustrated because of the people that you are, are in connection with aren't living up to your expectations, watch this. What if you begin to pray for them? What if you begin to extend mercy and grace to them? What if you begin to be as patient with them as God's been with you? I'm preaching better than you're saying Amen. But that's all right. Watch this. Here's the last thing you need to know with dealing with disappointment with others. I love this. You got to notice what Jesus did not say when he's addressing Martha. Because he never rebukes Martha for serving. What he does is he points out to her her worries and troubles. He says, you're worried, marry it. Martha was upset, watch this, not because of what she was doing. She was upset about what Mary was not doing. She had allowed her disappointment to distract her from the fact that Jesus was present. Here's the last point. Listen, listen. You can't allow your disappointment to become a distraction. What does Jesus tell Martha? You have allowed your worries and troubles to distract you. That's what he says. Distract you from what? Distract you from the fact that Jesus is at your house. See, the problem is we get so caught up in what others are or are not doing that we miss the fact that Jesus is right there in front of us. And what's Jesus do? Jesus says, Martha, 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 take your eyes off of Mary and put them on me. He doesn't, he doesn't get upset at Mary for worshiping. And he doesn't get upset at Martha for serving. Because watch this. Both are acts of worship. The only difference is Martha's mad because Mary isn't worshiping him the way she wants to. Well, I, I worship Jesus by serving. Well, good. Keep serving. And Mary worships him by gathering at his feet and listening. Well, good. Gather at his feet and listen. Both are acts of worship. Whatever you do, you do it under the Lord. The problem is when we get mad at others because they don't worship like we do. Because watch this. Martha's trying to worship by impressing Jesus. Mary's worshiping by being impressed by Jesus. <laughs> And the problem Martha has is she allows her disappointment to become a distraction from who's in the building. 
here's, here's the truth. Ready for this? Here's how to get over your disappointment in others. Fix your eyes on Jesus instead of others. I, I hate to bust your bubble, but if, if you keep living, they're going to keep disappointing. People are going to disappoint you. That's why we don't fix our eyes on them. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Second disappointment is this. I need you to, to deal with this because not only does he give us grace deal with the, uh, our disappointment in others. Watch this. Grace helps us heal from disappointment in ourselves. Oh, we're going to talk about it. It's one thing to be disappointed by others, but it's an even, even greater pain when we get disappointment in ourselves. Many of us wrestle with this idea of a pain from being a letdown. I've let others down. I've let mom and dad down. I've let God down. And we're always talking about our disappointment in ourselves. But this is what I've come to realize, y'all. Most of the disappointments we have in ourselves are because of unmet expectations that others have projected onto us. I was having a conversation with a young person uh, just a few weeks ago and, and they said, you know, I'm really struggling because I feel like I've let everybody down. I said, really, what, is, what, what do you mean by that? Where is that coming from? And this young person said, well, really and honestly, like I, I didn't go to college and, and you know, my family really wanted me to, to go to college. My mom and dad had gone to college and, and that's what they wanted for me, but I didn't really feel like that's what I was supposed to do and now I feel like I've let everybody down. And I said, oh, so what you're telling me is is not that you're, you're disappointed in you. You're disappointed in you because you hadn't done what they wanted. In other words, it's not that you hadn't lived up to your expectation. It's that you hadn't lived up to their expectation of you. How do I know this? Because they didn't say, well, I really wanted to go to college, but I didn't do it. They said, everybody else wanted me to go and I didn't do it. So, so they're, they're, they're blaming themselves not for not living up to their own expectations, but from living up to the expectations others have placed on them. Listen to what John 12 says. We've dealt with Martha. Let's talk about Mary for a moment. Six days before the Passover, this is verse one, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, the one whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. I love that. You know what he's saying? Hey, by the way, there was nothing rebuking about Martha serving. I love how he points this out. She's serving, but she didn't go through any issues this time. Why? Because she had been de dealing with her disappointment. Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with Jesus. Then Mary took a pint of nard, an expensive perfume, and poured it on the feet of Jesus, and she wiped his feet using her hair. The house was filled with a fragrance of perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas, who was later to betray him, I love how John throws that in there, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and money given to the poor? For it was worth a year's wages. So let me press pause for a minute and just set the stage. So Jesus and the disciples have gathered once again at Martha's house. I don't know, maybe they're having gospel circle, hallelujah. And while they are there, Mary decides to make an entrance. And Mary busts up in the men's meeting that night. She busts open her alabaster box and pours out a year's worth of wages that is found in perfume on the feet of Jesus. Now, 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 now listen to me. She completely came in uninvited. She completely broke protocol when she entered the room that she wasn't even invited to. And then not only did she do that, she, she commenced to doing an act that the other people in the room didn't approve of. And immediately they become disappointed, why? Because here's Mary who has just poured out a year's worth of wages of Chanel number five on the feet of Jesus. And she has let down the other people in the room. And I love that it's Judas. Because <laughs> one translation says, Judas was mad even though he had been taking money the whole time. 
But he's mad at Mary. Why? Because he has projected an expectation onto her that she's not living up to. Now don't miss this. I can imagine that once Mary started the process and the criticism began to flow, I guarantee you she probably started having thoughts like, oh, oh gosh, I wish I wouldn't have done this. Or, you know, oh man, here it is again. I've done it again. I've disappointed other people. Because Mary enters the, enters the room already carrying emotional baggage. She was not, she lived a lifestyle they didn't approve of. She, she is entering into an environment that she's not welcome in and now she's doing something, an activity that they don't agree with. And I can imagine she starts to feel the weight of the disappointment of, oh, I've blown it again. Oh, I've messed up again. And Judas didn't like what she was doing and he was disappointed. But here's the funny thing. If you look back at verse two, it reads this. It says, here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. So wait a minute. Judas is disappointed. The problem is the dinner isn't for Judas. The Bible says the dinner was for Jesus. Here's what I've come to learn, Wanda. Most people that are disappointed in you always try to make it about them. (laughs) And they're mad because you've made it about Jesus and you hadn't made it about them. Well, hey, I want you to go with me. You know, so, so, oh, 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 I would, but I can't. I've got, I've, got, I've got something going on that night. I've got gospel circle that evening. <sighs> oh, I, I would, I'd love, hey, hey come over by. We're, we're, come on, we're, we're grilling hot dogs tonight. Oh, I would, but we got a night of ministry. <sighs> Didn't you go to church this morning? Twice in one day? My gosh. And, and they begin to project guilt onto you. You know what's funny? When you make it about the one that matters, the ones that don't might get mad. But you'll be, you won't be disappointed because the only one whose opinion that matters in the room. You know what Jesus says? I love this. Jesus says, leave her alone. Because not only did Judas get mad, read, read the script. The scripture says other disciples begin to chime in. And here's what Jesus says, y'all leave her alone. Because y'all are upset even though I know. See, what I, if I'd have been Jesus, I'd have been like, Judas, really? You, you want to do this now? Because we all know what you got going on behind the scenes. And you want to make it about the money. Really, Judas? This is what you want to talk about tonight. But Jesus is gracious. He goes, hey, God, just leave her alone. For the, the poor will always be amongst you. In other words, what he's saying is there's always going to be an opportunity for you to do the other stuff. But you need to recognize that, that this thing's about me. So you need to understand. People get mad when it's not about them. And they won't understand when you make it about him. Stop, get, stop letting the expectations of others cause you to live in disappointment of yourself because you've made it about something that matters more than they care about. You're not going to impress them because you've made it about Jesus. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm almost appalled at how many believers are, are, can't believe that other people are frustrated with them because they don't understand it. And you're, you're letting their frustration be projected onto you. Why? You just simply need to recognize like, okay, well, they don't know what I know so they, they, they can't understand what I understand. Right. See, when you've encountered Jesus, you don't need to explain yourself to anybody. Right. Like there's, it's powerful when you actually let it, let the banquet be about him. Yeah. That's what Mary did. I was having a conversation this weekend. It was actually in a, in a counseling session. And the person asked me what was a really great question. He said, how is it that so many young people, 
And I, I, I was assuming he was talking about me when he asked the question. How is it, he said, he said, how is it that so many young people are, are battling with depression? And I said, you really want to know what I think it is? He said, yeah. I said, I said, you need to understand something. My generation was the last generation whose schedules didn't determine the family schedule. So, so let me say like this. When I was growing up, Wednesday night was God's night. And Sunday morning was God's. It didn't revolve around me. I never, I never woke up on Sunday morning and said, hey, mom and dad, can we please go to church today? I woke up going, oh, can we just sleep in? And they said, no. Now watch it, we were real religious. But I thank God that my parents built an environment that didn't center around me. It did. We, let me tell you, it was real simple. On Wednesday night, I don't care what you think you got. I don't care what ball practice you got. I don't care what dance rehearsal you got. On Wednesday night, we go into church. Because this thing is not about you. Y'all ain't saying much. I'm just preaching, y'all. And, and here's what I told him. I said, I said, here's the problem. Like, when we create now, because now we just, you tell me what you want. My parents never said, what do you want for dinner? We go into Hardee's. Well, I want McDonald's. Okay, we'll go to Hardee's, then we'll go to McDonald's for you. That never happened in my car. <laughs> I'm in the back of the station wagon. The, the, the part that don't have seats. And I'm going, hey, we, have, we didn't have seats or nothing. And I'm going, hey, I want a Happy Meal. And they're like, you better hope Hardee's has them. <laughs> no, I know what I want. That's fine. You either going to eat what we got or you ain't going to eat. That's how it was. See, now they'll call child protection services on you. When I was growing up, the world didn't revolve around me. Hey, daddy, I got ball practice Sunday morning. The devil is alive. My daddy get real Pentecostal quick. I got travel ball. That's fine. You better hope you can walk to your destination. You travel on by yourself. I'm just telling you right because it was different and I, and I said here's I said here's what's happened in my, my opinion this is my, my opinion you don't have to agree with it you can be wrong it's fine I said but here's what happens when you are raised and groomed to think that the world revolves around you and your schedule and your desires the problem is the flip side of that coin is you're responsible for keeping that universe spinning and we have people depressed. We have people who, are, who are, 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 can't carry the weight because now all of a sudden everything's about them and things ain't happening like they want them to happen. I, I, I'm sorry. Boy, I'm gonna tell you something. Some, the way some of us are raising our kids, I say us, I'm raising them too, me and Caleb. The way some of us are raising our kids, we're making it hell on their future spouses. I'm sorry, there ain't no way to sugarcoat it. My God, because we are just whatever they ask for, whatever they want. We're making it about it. Like we're doing a disservice. We cannot think that we are the ones that the dinner's being served for. Jesus says this. He says, leave her alone. He says, y'all think this is about y'all? It's about me. Are y'all getting this? And, and the reason people get disappointed in you is because you hadn't made it about them when you've made it about him. And I love that, because you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus said, hey, 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 hey. He says, leave her alone, y'all. He says, hey, Mary, it don't matter what anybody else thinks, as long as I'm pleased. You're good. Stop worrying about what everybody else is saying. Are y'all getting this? You'll, you'll stop living in perpetual self-disappointment when you begin to let the voice of the critics carry less weight in your life. Make it about him. What's he say? He says, you're, you're my child and I'm well pleased. You know what he says? You're accepted in the beloved. You ain't got to impress everybody else because I'm telling you right now, you're accepted in the beloved. You are loved unconditionally. Are y'all with me? Let me close with this, y'all. So, 
We talked about how to deal with disappointment. Others, we talked about how to heal from disappointment ourselves. Watch this. Grace will also help reveal disappointments you have in God. <laughs> now, I know this is the part where you're like, can we just be honest, where cheeks get clenched. Because <laughs> how dare we talk about being disappointed in God? I was raised where you didn't, you didn't question God. But, but, but I love this because cause can we just be honest for a minute? Some of us struggle because we have soul wounds where God didn't live up to our expectations in a certain matter. Now, let me, let me offer a really a disclaimer. God always fulfills his promises. He is a promise keeper. Our disappointment resides in the area where God doesn't do it when we want him to like we want him to. Right? So he hadn't let us down, but he hasn't met our expectations of doing it how we want him to, when we want him to do it. We talked about Mary, we talked about Martha. Let's talk about Lazarus for a minute. I love this. John 11, verse one says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and Martha. It was that Mary that anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Don't you love that? As you're talking about the prayer of manipulation. <laughs> hey, hey, Jesus, we're not like, hey, I, wanna, I just want to pray for my brother. We're like, hey, I'm, pray, I'm talking about praying for the guy that you love so much. I just want to remind you how much you love my brother. The one you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha loved her sister Mary and loved Lazarus. So, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days. What a friend we have in Jesus. He loved Martha, he loved Mary, he loved Lazarus. We see that the sisters send a message to Jesus that Lazarus is sick. Now, now, let me say this. There is no doubt in my mind that Jesus is good. Do you agree with that? There is no doubt in my mind that it's Jesus' will for Lazarus to live. I believe that. Got it set on my heart. So knowing those truths, if I didn't know the rest of the story, my expectation would be for Jesus to stop what he's doing and go lay hands on Lazarus and heal him. Do you agree? And that is the exact same expectation that Lazarus' sisters have. But when Jesus doesn't meet that expectation, it causes them to be disappointed. So one more time, let's be clear and set the stage, you ready? Jesus loved Lazarus. Lazarus is sick. Jesus loves Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary ask Jesus to come heal Lazarus. So then Jesus goes and heals Lazarus, correct? That's the expectation, right? But as we're finding more and more in scripture, our experience doesn't always match our expectations. Now, now, let me just say this, because I do believe sometimes we can, not as much with God, but we can have unrealistic expectations. But let's just think about Martha and Mary for a moment, y'all. They have watched and witnessed Jesus heal people all over the land. They've watched him heal blind beggars. They've watched him heal centurion servants. They've watched him heal people who interrupted his moment of ministry in order to get their need met by pressing through a crowd and touching the hem of his garment. So I don't think it is an unrealistic expectation 
for Mary and Martha to think if Jesus would do all those things for all those people that he didn't even know, that certainly he would do it for someone like Lazarus that not only he knew, but he proclaimed he loved. So I don't know about you, but I don't see that that's an unrealistic expectation. But Jesus, in spite of the circumstances, don't miss this, he disappoints his friends. But here's what you need to set on your heart. Even though he disappoints them, it doesn't mean he doesn't love them. Because some of us, begin to question when God doesn't meet our expectation, we begin to question whether or not he loves us. (laughs) Can I just ask you a question? What do you do when the God who loves to love you doesn't love you like you want to be loved? What do you do when the God who loves to love you doesn't love you the way you want to be loved. Because now Mary and Martha are dealing with an unmet expectation. Verse 17 says, when Jesus came, he found that he had already been dead in the tomb for four days. That's important because understand, in their culture, once you got to day four, you were definitely dead. (laughs) And we read that when Jesus arrives... Many of the Jews, including Mary and Martha, were disappointed and grieving. They're upset because their brother is gone. But watch this. To make matters worse, the one person who could have done something about it didn't do anything about it. So they now are clearly disappointed in Jesus. But here's the crazy thing about all of it. Jesus' entire ministry was built on disappointing others. Oh, some of y'all don't believe me. Let, me. let me explain to you. Watch this. They wanted Jesus to be born in a palace. Nope. He was born in a manger. They wanted Jesus to be born in a, in a perfect union between a man and a woman. Nope. He was born of a virgin birth. Just a small town girl living in a lonely world. Jesus, as a child, watch this. He's in the temple. His mom and dad take him to church and he's arguing with the pastors. They're disappointed. How can our son be acting like this? And what's Jesus say? Nope, I'm all about my father's business. Jesus is standing in front of thousands of people and the disciples say, hey, rabbi, they're hungry. And Jesus had fed them before by using a two-piece from Long John Silver. And they say, hey, feed us. Nope, I am the bread of life. And they're mad, they're disappointed, why? Because he was their king, but they wanted a burger king. They wanted to have it their way. Hey, rabbi, hey, do that magic trick again where you take the fish and chips and you multiply it and y'all eat. Nope, they're disappointed. Everywhere Jesus went, he, he's, he's coming into the holy city. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And a week later, when he doesn't do what they think he should do, crucify him. Yes, crucify him. Amen. Crucify him. Why? He was always disappointing others. The only person he didn't disappoint, watch this, was the father. For this is my beloved son. Not in whom I'm disappointed. In whom I'm well pleased. So, pick back up in the story. Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, went and met him while Mary sat at the house. Now don't you think for one minute, I I believe this with all my heart, that when Martha got there, she had a little bit of an attitude. I believe she got out there and put her hand on her hip, let her backbone slip. (laughs) Hey, Jesus, nice of you to join us. A little late, aren't we? You sure weren't late when I invited you to my house for dinner. 
I believe she had an attitude. She's disappointed. And what she say? I love this because she never loses faith. Listen to what she says. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, in the midst of all this, I know that whatever you ask of God, he'll give it to you. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again, Martha. Martha says to him, oh, I know. Here's where she gets theological, right? Oh, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection during the last day. And Jesus says to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And watch this. He says, do you believe this? And she says to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. Now watch this, and I'm done. Don't miss Martha's dilemma. First she says, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Watch this. She's referring to the past. But Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And then Martha jumps from the past all the way over to the future. Listen to what she says. Oh, I know that he will rise one day. And look at Jesus' response. Jesus says, he doesn't say, but I did. And he doesn't say, but I will. He says, I am. He says, I am. See, here's what happened. Grace reveals Martha's disappointment in God. She is seeing God in her past and she is seeing God in her future, but she's not recognizing the power of his presentness. And many of us, watch this, are living the same way Martha's living. One of the biggest issues in our church today, in the, the church, is people are either focused on the past Jesus or the future Jesus. They're not focused on the now Jesus. They have faith about what he did. Oh, I read my Bible. And about what's to come. Escape. We got to get us out of here. We're praying for a rapture. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I am. I'm not the great I was. I'm not the great I will be. I am the great I am. But watch this. Here's where many of us are. We, we live in the past. If you would have kept him from abusing me, then I wouldn't have all these issues. If you would have just touched my body, I wouldn't be facing this bad report from the doctor. If you would have just given me that promotion, I wouldn't be in the predicament I, I'm in, losing my job and struggling financially. If you would have, if you would have. And then some of us are saying, if I can just make it, until Jesus comes back. If I can just get to that point, if I can just get to the place where I don't have to deal with this stuff in heaven. And the problem is, Jesus is not in the, if you would have been, and he's not in the, if you will, Jesus is in the, I am what you need. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the truth. I am the way. I am your present help in time of need and if you believe that all over this building take about 10 seconds to give him a great I am praise he ain't gotta be about your past and he ain't worried about your future he's in your today right now He's the great I am. Amen. You know, he's not the alpha, then the omega. He's the alpha and the omega. In other words, he's at your beginning and he's at your end at the same time. I love this because let's, let's keep reading. In verse 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life and whosoever believes in me will not die but live forever and then he says to Martha do you believe now watch this this is why I'm ending y'all stand to your feet it's what I believe y'all I believe this entire encounter found in the gospel of John 
is for a purpose. And that purpose is because Jesus wants to reveal himself in a new way to show Mary, to show Martha, to show Lazarus just how much he loves them. Can we just be honest for a moment? If, if Jesus shows up on day one, hey, Jesus, I don't know if they called him or texted him. I'm not sure what happened, but <laughs> pigeon, I'm not sure. But, hey, Jesus, come heal Lazarus. Okay. Hey, guys, my buddy's sick. Let's go take care of him. If Jesus shows up on the first day and heals Lazarus, can we just be honest? It probably doesn't even make the highlight reel. It, 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 it won't even make headlines. Why? Because Jesus has been doing that all over the place. There's a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. Jesus didn't know him. Hey, man, be healed. There's a man 38 years lame down at the spa of Bethesda. And Jesus shows up and says, hey man, you want to be made well? Pick your mat up and walk. Jesus had done some incredible things. And if he shows up the first day and meets, don't you miss this, meets the expectations of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, watch this, they would have been all happy, but have been like, oh, that's just what Jesus does. Because familiarity breeds dishonor. And Jesus is like, I don't, y'all, y'all, see what happens is when you're really close to people that love you, your proximity will cause you to have a lack of awareness of just how much they love you. Because you get become so comfortable in the proximity that you just begin to take it for granted. That's just life. But Jesus knows this. And he's like, you know what I want to do for my friends? I want to blow their mind. And if I meet their expectations, they'll be happy. But in three days, they'll be, we're going to be worn off. And they'll be like, oh, that's just, Jesus does that for everybody. And they won't recognize the value of the relationship. So you know the rest of the story, right? Finally, after Jesus settles Martha down, he's moved with emotion because he sees the pain and heartbreak of the people. And he says, I watch this, y'all. He says, hey, Lazarus, come forth. Y'all know why he called him by name, right? Because if he just said, come forth, hey, but a whole lot of dead folks showed up. (laughs) He's like, some of y'all need to stay where y'all at. Lazarus. Come forth. And Lazarus comes waddling out. He's still wrapped up in grave cloths. He didn't come walking out and be like, what's up? He's walking out and Jesus said, loose that man. And the Bible said they all rejoiced for they had never seen anything like that. And I can imagine Mary and Martha being overcome with emotions because it was in that moment that they realized just how much Jesus loved them you're going you did that for us we'd have been okay with just that but you did this which leads me to my final truth you need to know watch this Sometimes Jesus doesn't meet your expectations because sometimes Jesus wants to exceed your expectations. And if he always met them, he could never exceed them. And sometimes we have to give room for Jesus to do things like he wants to do. I don't know who I'm talking to in here today, but you have been living in perpetual disappointment. You have allowed your heart to be wounded because
because your expectations of God weren't met and it has caused you to wrestle in your faith. But I just came today to tell you that just because God hasn't done it doesn't mean he's not going to. And if you will just trust God by continuing to put your heart in his hands, he wants to reveal to you just how much he loves you. And what I love about Jesus is he will right in the middle of your story, he will turn your disappointment to a divine appointment. And right where you think you're going to meet your demise is where you'll meet your Jesus. Can I just pray over you? Just close your eyes if you would. Lord, I just thank you today that the shackles of disappointment, the pain that we've been carrying because others have let us down, it's coming off of us today. It's breaking off of people right now. Shackles are being loosed and people are, they're learning to trust again. They're learning to love again. They're not living in fear of it happening again but they're living in faith of you doing something beauty beautiful in the midst of their ashes Lord I thank you that today the disappointment we have in ourselves due to unmet expectations others have placed on us is dissipating as we speak that those those expectations are drifting off that the weight that they add to our lives we're, we're living free. Some of you, it's like a new lease on life today because you're no longer going to be bound by the expectations of others because you recognize the party is not about them. It's about the one who loves you named Jesus. And if you will continue to fix your eyes on him, his presence will silence their criticism. His praise will drown out their noise. Lord, I thank you that today, the Holy Spirit, you are healing the deep wounds and the chasms of our souls that has been caused because we felt disappointed in you. Because you didn't do what we thought you should do. Because you haven't done it when we thought you should do it. You didn't do it our way on our timing. And it's created in us a toxicity that has poisoned our faith. We've stopped believing so we wouldn't be let down because we cannot handle being disappointed in you. And Lord, I thank you today that you are lifting us from the pit of disappointment and fixing our eyes, our gaze upon the finished work of the cross and everything you have already done for us. And as the solution to our problems manifest. We are moved to be reminded of just how much you love us. That you would not just meet expectations. You would exceed them. In fact, you don't even just exceed our expectations. You do abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or even imagine. Because you're simply that good. So let our eyes be fixed on how good you are, not how bad things are. And our hope be stirred and our faith be restored so that we can live in a purity of knowing that you are God and there is none like you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for restoration. I thank you today that hearts are being united in faith so that we can dream again and not be afraid of what the future holds not framing it in fear but framing it in faith and declaring the word of the Lord and the promises of God for us are yes and amen and for that we give you Jesus all the glory all the honor and all the praise in your mighty awesome incredible name we pray can you just take about five seconds and lift up your voice and tell him thank you right now come on praise him like you believe it praise him like you receive it thank him right now that even if you hadn't seen it yet, you know it's coming. Love you. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. See you this evening, y'all, at Night of Ministry.